having me. It's, uh, it's always, uh, I always have a special place in my heart to, to, to community organizations like the DDSA and the International Bipolar Foundation, so I'm always glad, more than glad to help. Um, so I think, you know, based on the uh, sort of size of this room, I'll, I'll kind of go through the talk that I typically do, which includes some work on bipolar disorder and some work in other illnesses, more on the topic of healthy aging, and also healthy aging people without these illnesses. But I think as we go along, if you have questions or insights or thoughts, I'd love to hear your opinions. Um, so uh, these are kind of the main focus foci that I'll be covering today, which are the historical and contemporary definitions on what it is to be aging successfully, uh, and then how we're starting to think uh, we can apply some of these definitions and understandings to better uh, the care, I guess, of mental health problems, uh, and then talk about the behavioral and biological determinants of healthy aging and hopefully get some clues as to what we can do about aging. Uh, and present some data along those lines. So we actually started off, I've actually started my career working uh, in, in uh, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and aging. And uh, at the same time, actually, our uh, kind of one of the gurus in, in aging and those illnesses at UCSD got a kind of secondary gig as one of the leaders of the Stein Institute for Research on Aging. Uh, which didn't have anything to do with mental health before he got there. And so uh, we've kind of tried to blend the two focuses uh, together, and I'll show you some of the work we've done in that area. So I usually like to start, when we think about aging, just thinking about uh, sort of the, the old time uh, definitions and ideas about what it is to age well. So what's, what have people said in the past? And so here's Aristotle, who was 62 at the time of the sculpture. And with regard to aging, he was not particularly positive. So he said about older people that they've lived many years, they've often been taken in. Uh, the result is that they are uh, sure about nothing and they underdo everything. They're small-minded, they're cowardly, they're too fond of themselves. This actually goes on for about five pages. Uh, uh, it's just essentially the same exact tone. Uh, and so, why did he think this way? Well, in this time, aging was really thought of as a disease. So, based on this humoral theory of, of health. And so, aging is really seen as a, a, an intrinsic process, a disease. And really, the only thing you could do about it was to do sort of palliative care. Uh, so, the metaphor at the time was that aging was a drying and a cooling of the body. So like a lamp, it was basically a lamp going out. So you could potentially add a little heat and water to this mix to, to stop aging, but there really wasn't much more you could do besides stay away from older people. Uh, so that's one view, and I think this is kind of pervasive, pervasive still, I'd say. And then I would actually encourage anybody who's interested in aging well to read Cicero, uh, and not necessarily his whole body of work. He was a Roman statesman who kind of covered lots of different topics. But he did have a very nice essay on aging, called On Old Age. And in it, he basically took all the pre prior kind of criticisms that people like uh, Aristotle had levied against older people and refuted them. So for example, he said things like, older age withdraws us from active pursuits, but you can uh, pursue advisory functions and sort of adapt your role in life. Uh, he also said that, uh, among other things, that an old man never forgets where his treasure is buried. So he recognized that you still remember the things that are important to you. You may spend less time on things that aren't, like phone numbers and the like. So, uh, and so for him, I think aging was not a disease per se, but as a, a time of, uh, uh, of adaptation. And I think this is kind of a... a a pervasive theme that actually continued all the way into the 20th century and still probably today, that there is uh, one side which thinks of aging as a sort of inevitable decline. So Sigmund Freud, we all probably know, said that near or above the age of 50, the elasticity of the mental processes upon which treatment depends is as a rule lacking. Old people are no longer educable. So I think it's funny that he said this at age 49. <laughs> Uh, but the, the counterpoint to that is really that Erickson's view that life at the gateway to middle age will stimulate its own entry in sort of uh, new surprises and exhilarations of its own right. So he had kind of a different take 
that kind of more conform to what Cicero was talking about. So none of these folks ever used the term successful aging or healthy aging. And that's actually reasonably a new field. So the first time we were able to find in the literature anything about successful aging was in 1960. And the, the author of, or actually the editor of the kind of preeminent aging journal, The Gerontologist, said that I think successful aging is getting a maximum of satisfaction out of life. And so that's difficult to argue with, I think, at any rate, right? Uh, but there were later theories that kind of followed along and suggested that maybe one thing that's important for older people to do is to disengage from society and kind of retrofit their expectations for life. Whereas other people talked about maybe it's actually the exact opposite. You should be focusing on maintaining the things you used to do. Uh, but these were really based on data and weren't really linked with medicine by a biological theories. Uh, so actually, I think the first kind of real mention of successful aging in the medical literature was by Rowan Kahn. Now, Rowe is actually the CEO of Aetna Insurance currently, at least. So he went on to have a very successful business career, however you feel about Aetna Insurance. Uh, but he did study uh, aging at one point. And he wrote a very nice article along with his colleague about Basically, we spend most of our time in life studying the difference between pathology, like Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, and normal stuff, right, that happens to people. We haven't spent a lot of time at all understanding what the difference is between the usual course of life and success, uh, however defined. So we should spend, so we spend 99% of our time on this, and maybe we should spend a little bit more trying to understand what's different about people that seem to do well. And particularly, as we're going to talk about later, people who do well despite having uh, problems, such as bipolar disorder. So they did a, a, a series of studies, actually recruited a whole sample of people that they defined as successfully aging, and followed them for several years, and were reasonably successful in an academic sense. Um, but this is their definition of successful aging. So this is one way to think of what successful aging is. And I think uh, this is a, a pretty difficult bar for all of us to reach. So you have to be absent of disease or disability. You have to be uh, high in terms of cognitive and physical functioning relative to other people your age. And you have to be engaged with life. You have to be uh, either working, volunteering, doing something for the community, and uh, have friends that you can count on and rely on. So most people do okay with this and that one, but it's pretty hard to reach older age and still be undisabled and without any diseases. So actually a recent study looked at really kind of how common this is. Uh, so uh, actually when you put all those things together, if you had to have all those things, it's only about 11 or, I'm sorry, 12% of the population. This is a large study of Americans, the Health and Retirement Survey. Uh, what's interesting is that each one of these individual components is actually reasonably common, but when you add them all together, uh, it's pretty, pretty rare to be successfully aging. So this is one way to look at it. And I'm going to argue that that's maybe not the best. Way. So based on this um, kind of work, we were interested in a center on studying successful aging. And so we started actually just with a, a fairly broad sort of review, a literature review. That's, that's right. Yeah, so this is a, a, basically a review of all the studies that had ever, as we find them, had ever reported on something around successful aging in a sample of older adults, at least 100 people, and it had to be published in English or at least translated into English in a peer review journal. So we just wanted to see how people were defining successful aging in the literature. And what we found were 28 different studies, and we found in those studies 29 different definitions. So this kind of means that nobody, none of the researchers that are out there in the field agree on what successful aging is. Uh, this graph basically just is a frequency count of the different domains that we found. And we found that most studies really focused on this sort of disability, physical functioning side of things. But after that, no single entity was in more than half of the definitions. Um, 
product. And so uh, it really basically means that when researchers are saying we're studying successful aging, they're talking about very different things. Um, so we actually got interested in this in thinking about why this discrepancy seems to be occurring. We actually also became interested in what older adults themselves think about what successful aging is. So we kind of know that this is what researchers think is successful aging, and we know that it's really rare, or pretty rare, it's 10% can consider that rare, and we also know that they don't really agree too well. So we asked a bunch of older people in San Diego, and we've been doing this for about 10 years, actually, uh, asking people with uh, various illnesses, uh, just sort of normal everyday people in San Diego, to rate themselves in terms of how successful they think they are in terms of their own aging. And so we had a scale from one being not at all good or not at all successful and 10 being, you know, most successful. And what we find is that actually when you ask people, they actually say that they're by and large doing fine. So we find that the vast majority of people rate themselves an eight, a nine, or a 10 on this scale. So that means that I would probably go see a movie if it were an eight or a nine or a 10. Uh, so most people actually, um, think that they're doing pretty well. Uh, and that's in San Diego. We've had this in very large samples, so probably around three or 4,000 people that we've studied just with this one question. So one possibility is that older people are delusional, right? So they could be saying that they are doing well when in fact they're not. But what's interesting about this single question, how successful are you, is that it really one is that it's correlated positively with age, so the older you are, the more likely you are to feel like you're aging well in San Diego. Uh, you're also, the older, you, or the more successful you feel that you are, the more resilient you also feel you are. And then also it does correlate with physical functioning, which means that it probably does have some uh, merit as a variable, that self-rated success is actually important. And this is true of self-rated health as well. So these are useful variables in a lot of respects. Uh, that's kind of missing in people's definitions of success. So we got interested in this a little further. We asked older people, oh, yes? Oh, sorry. So you just did that study in San Diego, correct? Right. How do you think it would be somewhere else? So we've actually had people in Australia and I think China and other places rate. So one of, yeah, that's one question I often get is maybe it's just the nice weather. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when it's, it's actually been fairly remarkably consistent across okay. uh, the the few places we've looked, um, that, that there just definitely seems to be this shift where most people feel like, and I think this probably too, most people probably feel like they're doing above average. It's hard to say you're not, but I think that there's some merit to it that most people feel like. Um, it's a good question. So we asked people uh, in a variety of different ways, what do they mean? So we got curious about what did older people, what do they mean when they say successful aging? They're obviously not thinking about disease, disability necessarily. So a colleague of mine uh, uh, did a number of focus groups and then did some individual interviews uh, uh, and really just asking the question of what do they think, what do older people think define success in this regard. And what we found were that uh, kind of a lot like what Cicero said is that older people don't really emphasize being uh, free of illness or free of disease, but being able to adapt and have a positive attitude towards the future and why. So there's some quotes that exemplify these. So for example, this moment right now because my organs are working is life. So I would call that sort of a sign of adaptation. Your own image of yourself is not necessarily that. If somebody in their 20s, 30s, or 40s, you gotta realize you're not and say, okay, it's all right and suit your desires to what's realistic. So basically, change what you're interested in in order to uh, do well. And then I think the Beyond that, then there's sort of a pressure, in a sense, to, to do something about that. So we're still growing. We enjoy going to a movie. We still enjoy sleeping with people. We are not sitting in our rooms waiting for something to happen. So this idea of with adaptation is still moving forward with goals in mind. So this is kind of a long-winded way of saying that this is a topic, this is a lecture on successful aging. There is really no definition of successful aging. So there are probably as many definitions as there are studies and researchers but I think there is really an agreement that there's probably more than one thing that can define success. Uh, that uh, I will skip that second part because we didn't cover that that much. But this, there is this big dis divergence between researchers and lay definitions 
uh, with particularly older people more emphasizing adaptability rather than freedom from diseases and illness. So that's, that's kind of where we are when we're thinking about successful aging and general aging. What about as applied to mental health conditions like bipolar disorder? And this has always been a real interest of mine in terms of thinking about these kinds of questions. So what are the characteristics of people who seem to succeed in life? People like Ellen Sachs or uh, John Nash or people that might uh, come to mind, who J.K. Jameson, people who've written books about how to adapt to these. What are the characteristics of people like that who seem to dis succeed despite mental health problems? Uh, and how? It's a little bit of a different question. What do they do? Uh, how do they adapt well to these illnesses? And what we refer to as adapting well, it's kind of fitting with the idea of recovery. And then there's another related question, but what are the characteristics of people that have risk factors for illnesses? So for example, let's say everyone in your family uh, has a, a high degree of alcoholism or Alzheimer's disease, yet you don't seem to get it. Uh, that what is it that you've done to avoid potentially your genetic kind of uh, risk for those things. So this is all in the context of the kind of sobering reality that most or many people with uh, mental health problems actually don't live uh, uh, till, till later life. Uh, and so we are talking about a survivor cohort when we're talking about people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or substance abuse, people who've made it to 70 or 80 years old. Uh, so the average amount of years of life lost per illness is, is pretty remarkable. These are on par with cancer. In fact, I just read that the uh, cost of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder is greater than that for all cancers combined. So uh, we're talking about a fairly uh, profound impact on people's lives. But we got interested in aging and potentially successful aging, and I'll show you some slides on schizophrenia uh, in the next few. Uh, and so this is a scale, these are actually this is a scatter plot, so the y-axis being uh, scores on a scale called the SF36, which is self-rated function uh, and by age, and so each of the dots represents an individual. And this is in normal uh, controls, so people without psychiatric illnesses, I'll say healthy controls. So if you look at the sort of age trend, it's pretty flat. So these both physical and mental health are reasonably stable across the lifespan. However, in patients or people with schizophrenia, the, there's a cross. So the blue bar is mental health, and actually there seems to be a little bit of an increase uh, across this sample of around 500 people with schizophrenia, whereas it's the physical health declines just as it does uh, in, the, in the healthy uh, comparison subjects. So actually, we were just talking about Sally Shepard, who's uh, a great friend and colleague, and uh, one of the uh, probably one of the people that we would think about when, when we think about successful aging with mental health problems. This is a this is a study that she did. Uh, it led and through through NAMI, and this is uh, was published in Schizophrenia Bulletin a couple of years ago. And what we wanted to know from the perspectives of people with schizophrenia was what. How has your experience of living with this illness changed for you? Uh, and so universally asking people this question, we heard about very difficult early experiences. So for example, uh, when I was uh, young, I was in special ed classes, and, and I, uh, I used to tell the voices not to bother me, but they wouldn't stop, right? So just a, just a horrific start. But without question, all but one of the people that we talked to said that their symptoms had improved. And in particular, that they had changed their kind of perspective on their symptoms. So for example, this person talking about how they would uh, stop and think before assuming that other people uh, might be talking about them. So, or another person would stop and think a little bit before they would do something that would be detrimental to their well-being. So we were really impressed with how much symptom improvement uh, and how much sort of active management that people were doing and learned to do over their lifespans. But then when it came to their outlooks uh, over time, we found something quite different and unique. Uh, in that there, were, there was a pretty wide variability in how people thought about the future moving forward. Some people felt like they had missed out 
on life, right? They had missed out on things that they had wanted to do, or they weren't smart enough and, and didn't have money because they were comparing to themselves to where they should have been at this time, or they think they should have been. Uh, another group of people felt like they were a failure by society standards, but potentially uh, they felt better about themselves in life because they weren't having the same problems they used to have, and they felt comfortable enough with what they had. But then a third group of people was actually kind of going back and trying to redo some of the things that they had missed out on. So for in this particular woman's case was driving a car and getting a bank account and kind of restarting things that they had missed out on. I don't sort of characterize that as recovery in a sense. So there's, even though that people, I guess the main point here is that there, there seems to be a universal in this small sample improvement in symptoms, but really a kind of big divergence in how people see themselves uh, and see their future moving forward. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, so another interesting group, which is falls, I think, under the mental health domain is are people with HIV who are over 50. Uh, so these are, uh, by 2015, over half the people who are HIV positive uh, will be older than age 50. And, uh, What's happened really in the course of this illness, which is, 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 is a, makes it an interesting group, is that there's a new, the sort of newer medications have really created a group of people that can live uh, longer now, which where, where this wasn't possible before. So we really don't know much about what it's like to live to an older age with HIV. And what we found uh, in a sample of 74 people who are older and middle aged with HIV was that. If we thought about successful cognitive aging, so cognitive impairments are often accompanying uh, HIV, about a third of people might meet criteria for aging well, at least cognitively. And we correlated the membership as sort of being successful with, with, uh, with HIV in terms of cognitive functioning. What we find is that people with, uh, with, uh, who are successful seem to have better skills in medication adherence and also have better alliance with healthcare providers. But what's also interesting is that there are things that weren't predictive, so CDC counts, so the actual severity of the illness, or the duration of the illness, or the physical problems that they had were not associated with their cognitive function. So there does seem to be some ways of understanding and teasing apart uh, kind of what it is that seems to create these successful trajectories. And this is obviously a very initial pass in, in, in a reasonably uh, low-grade science, uh, but we're moving forward with this in a number of large cohort studies. Here's another, uh, we were talking about risk factors before. Uh, what are the people that seem to have pathology, but yet don't seem to have uh, the kinds of problems that we might see? So there's actually been a number of studies looking at nuns over time. And uh, actually, the nuns have been gracious enough to lend their brains to science after they died. And what's been fascinating is that the kinds of whole, the, 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 we have the good data on their cognitive functioning earlier in life. And what they found is that uh, the amount of holes in the brain that they find later, which are usually what we would not want to have, is not necessarily associated with how cognitively uh, adept they were. So there isn't a one to one relationship between cognitive. Uh, I'm sorry, neuropathology and cognitive performance. And so one question is, maybe people with Alzheimer's disease, or who are at risk for Alzheimer's disease pathology, uh, you know, sort of just have a, a greater reset of resources, and so you have a better brain going into older age, uh, then maybe you're more protected from the holes that you get. Another possibility is that your brain may respond to to, to the actual insults that are associated with Alzheimer's disease in a different way, such that we actually have kind of neuroplasticity and change, which would have to occur in later life. And this study actually found that patients that seem to not show these sort of cognitive declines, even in the presence of Alzheimer's pathology, showed increases in, in blood flow before their death. So they actually seem to respond and adapt to uh, Alzheimer's disease, whereas those that did show cognitive impairment did not adapt. And so again, this kind of more fits with the Cicero model, I think, of adaptation as key to success. So in terms of this section, this is very kind of early preliminary stuff, um, and, and, and certainly you know, interesting, but I think we'll, we'll expand. But I think we really, 
uh, have an opportunity to understand success in populations, particularly in groups of people that are really marginalized or, or not necessarily used to participating in research. We have technologies now that I think are able to better understand the trajectories of people who seem to be successful at the time. So, I'm going to talk, switch gears and talk about aging in general uh, for this next little bit. But um, how many people know why we age? Why is it that we age? Yeah, it's still, nobody does, actually. That's a good question. So there's a, nobody really still knows the answer to this question. Um, there's actually some pretty fascinating stuff out I'm there. I'm say our children. That's right. Yeah, we'll have some. So that they, they do cause aging. Um, so, so this is a wives, wives, life, So this is life. A mouse is a. It, it's pretty pretty similar to a bat. I think we could all agree, right? It's just basically a bat without wings, and a turtle is kind of like a, a shellless uh, or swim, a lizard with a shell. But it's pretty remarkable to look at the difference in terms of the maximum lifespans among these. Right? So it's about a tenfold difference in those, maybe even more, maybe more like 10 or 30 fold difference uh, between these species. Why is that? Well, there's something that's regulating the rate of aging in these animals. And so we should hopefully figure out what it is and then do something so that we're maybe short of growing wings that we could live longer. Um, so another sort of potentially trick question, but what, what do you think the genetic or heritability of longevity, how long you live. Well, what percent uh, of the amount of, this is sort of what you think about, uh, what percent of the amount that you live, the length of your life, is associated strictly with your genes? So for example, your height is 90% associated with your genes. So no matter almost what you do after you're born, your height is going to be about what it was going to be when you were born. Um, so when you think about that as 90% for height, where would you put your lifespan? Would you say it's less, more, determined completely by genes? Less. Less. So what would you say with genes? 30%. 30%. Any other, anybody go higher or lower here? Higher. higher we go. So it's actually 20 to 30%. So that it's, uh, this, is, this is how we know. I wish I was that lucky with the lottery. Right. <laughs> yeah. So this is how we would know. It's actually from twin studies. So with twin studies, you have uh, identical twins and you have dizygotic twins. And so uh, these are actually the ages of one twin plotted against the other twin. And this is in identical twins. And then this box is in uh, fraternal twins. As you can see, the dots here are kind of a little bit more related. They don't sort of seem completely as random as over here. It looks more like a polka dot uh, poster. And so really the idea is we can calculate the difference between the association here in these two samples and say that about 20 to 30 percent of your uh, uh, longevity is associated with what you're born with. So that leaves a lot to be determined after birth. Um, and so Obviously, you want to choose the right parents in terms of living on, but it doesn't really do all that much for you, uh, as much as other things. Another interesting sort of finding uh, is that uh, even in genetically identical worms that are raised in the exact same jar, so they have the same exact environment, you'd assume that they'd all live the same length, right? Because they have the same environment, same genes, that should be about uh, the same in terms of how long they live. There's actually huge variability. So there's kind of sort of, sort of a lot of randomness in terms of how long these worms live so uh, that we really still yet don't understand. <laughs> so whenever you hear it's all in the genes as far as uh, aging and how long you're going to live, I think that's a good thing to, to kind of doubt. How many and people spend half of their lives worried you know, lost a parent at age 50 or right. 55, 60, 65, Heart attack or and spend half of their lives but that's a calibrating curse, to that. Right? Mm -hmm. That's how much time they have, or yeah. dreading, or anticipating, and driving themselves a bit crazy. Which can also, you which know, can show your life span, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sort of a self fulfilling yeah. process. Yeah. Um, so the, the other thing to think about with aging uh, is, I think, how lucky we are at this particular time. 
Uh, and so I usually like to show what aging was like 100 years ago, 150 years ago. So this is actually the population pyramid in 1900. So basically each bar is the proportion of the population that, uh, the proportion of the population. So as you, the triangle here in 1900 means that very few people made it past 65. Uh, and, and then if you bounce ahead about two or three generations, it becomes a rectangle in a pretty short order. So actually now there are more people over the age 60 than there are children for the first time ever in recorded history. Uh, so this is a pretty remarkable shift uh, in terms of the population. Here's the situation in Japan and how it's sort of projected to be. So in Japan, uh, was a triangle in 1950, and then 50 years later it's a box, and then another 50 years after that it's an upside down triangle. So that's a pretty rapid, rapid change. Uh, and why is that? Well, one of the reasons is that uh, our lives are, are different. We actually are healthier. Our health span is longer now. So this is actually, uh, I would encourage, if you're interested in about the history of aging, I would definitely encourage anybody to read uh, Robert Fogel's works. And so he's actually gone back and studied the Union Army uh, soldiers and their descendants. And so uh, he's done sort of a lot of looking at medical records of people who were in in the Union Army, and actually, it turns out that the average guy in 1950 was around five foot seven and weighed 148 pounds. And just 150 years later, so three generations later, perhaps, he's gained two inches in height and 50 pounds. And so, gaining 50 pounds doesn't sound very good, but actually, this guy was pretty malnourished. And so he had a lot of uh, reason. He's probably underweight. Not to say that that's just a little overweight, but. What you see is that actually, when you look at the age of onset, in which people get the illnesses that relate to aging, like heart disease, arthritis, neoplasms, or cancer, people actually, on average, get those around 10 to 15 years later than they used to. So they live longer without illnesses than they used to. Um, so that's something to be thankful for, at least with respect to age-associated illnesses. This is also what it was like for those, that cohort of people. So 25% died in infancy. Uh, I think the rate is about 1% now. 40% died before they reached the age of 15. Um, what you probably were going to die for was not something related to aging at all. It was probably bad water, infectious diseases, and so forth. Um, in terms of what people did with their time, we think we worked hard now. Is actually, the, this is you know industrial era, even before that, people spend most of their lives at work and have very little leisure time now, around 50 percent, or in theory we would do. Uh, food and clothing and shelter were most of what we spent our money on, but now we really don't. So I think there's a kind of, the point here being is that this is the generation of people that have an opportunity to age well has never been, I think, possible before. A couple more slides on this idea of aging from a biological standpoint. Um, there's still no real biomarker for aging. So, so one sort of thing that says how old we are, besides our age, that does better than chronological age. Uh, but recent years has really, how many people have heard of telomeres? I think this has been in the news a lot lately. So these are basically the uh, ends of the chromosome. Uh, so each time a chromosome um, replicates, part of this telomere is cleaved off. Uh, and so the shorter the telomere, uh, it's assumed the sort of faster the rate of aging, so cellular aging, has occurred. Um, and there's been a number of studies looking at the association of telomere length, longer will be better in this case, uh, uh, and uh, various aging-related outcomes. And so this is actually a study of 100-year-olds, uh, and so people who are already pretty healthy to make it to 100. And what they found is that even in that population that was already doing well, having a longer telomere was associated with a variety of benefits. So less fewer rates of diabetes, less metabolic syndrome, better cognitive functioning, and lower rates of hypertension. There has, and actually in this past week, been a very large study about depression and telomere length. 
So there is some idea that this is not a purely biological determined thing. There's been studies of caregivers, people who are under a high amount of, a high amount of stress, and their thought is, is that their telomeres become shorter than they would have as a result of that stress. And so some studies have shown that depression, people with depression seem to have shorter telomeres and the more severe depression that people have experienced throughout their lifespan is associated with even shorter telomeres. Um, there have been additional studies of schizophrenia and also caregiver stress and also HIV. So these are kinds of fundamental potential biomarkers that are potentially really interesting to study uh, from the perspective of both mental health conditions, I'd say, and aging, um, because I think that's where they kind of converge. So the question is, what thing can you make your telomeres longer? And actually, there is some um, ways of potentially doing that or protecting. Obviously, you can avoid stress. Uh, but there's some biological ways of uh, doing this, so sort of basically inhibiting the things that break down telomeres, uh, and that's going to be a hot field, I think, in the future. So as a pessimistic, I'm going to get into the idea of what can you do about aging. I have a pessimistic set of slides and an optimistic. I only have three pessimistic, and I think they're probably ten or fifteen optimistic ones. Uh, the first one I think pertains to mental health. And I think this is important for this kind of group in terms of advocating for uh, you know, mental health care, but is that when you think about something like depression or bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, everything that we know that behaviorally is associated with uh, lengthening the lifespan or reduce morbidity and successful aging uh, mm -hmm. seems to be affected by that when you think about it. So uh, people who are depressed get less exercise on average. They are less likely to have healthy diets they have lower rates of cognitive stimulation. They have lower levels of optimism, which is associated independently with lifespan. Uh, they typically have fewer social su supports. They have certainly less positive attitudes towards aging uh, and uh, are often undergoing a lot more stress than people without depression. So uh, that's, a, I think, a, a real pitch for why we need to treat depression because it sort of has a huge impact on people's access to successful aging. Um, and on a lighter note, I think people always ask when you should start worrying about aging. So the peak ages of your physiological performance start pretty early. So your hearing was at its highest when you were age five, uh, your smell at age 10, your taste at age 10, uh, your short-term memory at age 20. So you should have started thinking about aging maybe a few years ago. Uh, so uh, we're all kind of on the decline. And then the actual best way to extend the lifespan if you're a monkey or a mouse is something called caloric restriction. How many people have heard of that? So this is a, uh, basically eating uh, two thirds of what you would normally eat, reducing your diet by around a third. And so the monkey on the left has been subjected to a calorically restricted diet throughout his lifespan, and the monkey on the right just could eat whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in mice that are subjected to calorically restricted diets, they live about 40% longer, which is actually a pretty big amount. In monkeys, the effect size is much smaller, uh, but it is evident that he's kind of standing a little bit more upright. Uh, but my main point of this slide is that neither of them look particularly happy. Uh, <laughs> And uh, you know, the idea is that this is not necessarily going to, you know, especially before dinner as we are now, uh, going to necessarily improve your well-being, per se. Okay, so what about an optimistic view of successful aging? And I think this is probably true whether you have a mental health condition or not. But this is, uh, this is something called the, the U-shaped curve, which has been replicated in many countries. So this is life satisfaction plotted by age. And actually, when you look, about, you look at the population in multiple countries, this has been replicated many times, younger people are satisfied, and actually the least satisfied with their lives are people in their 40s and 50s. And you see, once you get into your 60s, regardless of what country you're in, for the most part, um, there's an increase to where you're actually almost back to where you were at the beginning. And this is replicated many different places. For whatever reason, Australians, there's no, it's just flat, so who knows? Uh, but this is a- uh, All those pub crawls. Right, I guess they just don't even know how to answer the question anymore. 
or they just stay satisfied. Um, so middle age is actually the period in which people are least satisfied with their lives. I think another way, especially for this group, is to sort of turn this thing around where we think about, well, you know, there's actually pretty good evidence for each of these individual things as alternative or additional or ancillary treatments for depression. So certainly exercise, diet, cognitive stimulation might actually be additional ways of chipping away at depression. And I'll show you a couple of slides um, that, that can get at that. So this is a study in major depression in older people where they compared, compared sertraline, I think is a, a SSRI, to uh, exercise. And then they also looked at the combination of those two. And what they found is that there was no difference in both groups got better with respect to depression. And actually, subsequent studies found that the people that just did exercise, didn't take a medication for depression, actually had more sustained benefits with regard to depression. So that's one way to get at this. And another way is maybe cognitive training. We were just talking about potentially the use of cognitive training. Uh, this was a large study that looked at healthy, for the most part, um, unaffected older adults, uh, looked at a 12-week cognitive training program with the main focus to see if it would improve their cognitive function. A secondary outcome is just to see if it improved depressive symptoms. And what they found is that in one of the conditions, helping people speed up their processing, actually there was a significant reduction in depressive symptoms uh, that was sustained as well. So there might be some evidence that cognitive training might actually improve your mood as well. There is a lot of talk about the Mediterranean diet, um, you know, these kinds of things, and dietary things, and people think about this with regard to cancer and other kinds of problems, but this is a study that looked at whether people adhere to this Mediterranean diet, which is low uh, saturated fats, high uh, fruits and nuts, lots of veggies, that sort of thing, and some red wine, and found that this seemed to be associated with the incidence of depression uh, nationally. We actually looked at this issue, uh, not with diet, but with BMI. And uh, we looked at this as it would pertain to cognitive function. This is a paper that's actually in press in bipolar disorders. And we found that uh, in bipolar disorder in particular, the higher the BMI, or if your BMI was above 30, uh, then you're actually, the effect of that on your cognitive functioning was as much as having bipolar disorder uh, at all. So if you had a normal uh, BMI with bipolar disorder, the actual uh, amount of cognitive impairment was, was pretty minimal. So I think that there's a, a good amount of evidence that some of these health behaviors can be particularly important for, for uh, serious mental health problems as well. Excuse me. Sure. I'm sorry. What's BMI? Oh, I'm sorry. Body mass index. So basically, it's a, an index of um, uh, overweight, basically. So uh, it's, a, it's a calculation, but the general rule of thumb, it's, it's a, basically it's high, your height. I don't know exactly the formula we're going to pull it up, but uh, it's just an indicator of how overweight people are. Um, so around 60% of, I think, people with bipolar disorder in the country at least have a BMI that's above normal. Uh, and around 40% of people without bipolar disorder have above normal. So this is a study looking at nurses. Are we going to ask something else, or did I answer your question? You answer. Okay. Thank you. So what this is looking at study looking at nurses, and not necessarily with, with uh, mental health problems, but looking at what if you combined all of these things? What if you had a healthy diet, you had uh, you exercised, you, you uh, weren't smoking, uh, you did all those things. You did, you did all the things you're supposed to do. What would be the effect of that on your rate of cardiovascular disease? And so this is people who are not smoking currently, they're actually drinking a little bit compared to not a lot, but not too much, getting exercise, and then uh, they were uh, eating a lot of fish, they had cereal, high cereal fiber, um, they didn't eat a lot of sugar. Um, so what they found is that relative to the people that didn't do any of those things, uh, the people that did all of them had reduced their risk of heart disease by 80%. So to where it was actually pretty unlikely that they were to get heart disease. So the idea is that you would probably take any medication that would reduce your risk of heart disease by 80%. If you could do those things, they have a remarkable effect. What I think is really fascinating is that in the neuroscience realm, 
each of these things, like cognitive training or crossword puzzles or dietary restriction or physical activity, they all seem very different, but they all have sort of the same mechanism. They're all kind of like stressors, like a little stressor. So if you get on the exercise bike and it kind of hurts a little bit, what you have are sort of a, is a stress response. And then your brain actually starts to kind of work a little harder like a muscle and produce neurotrophic factors and that actually tends to strengthen the brain as well as the muscles. So there's the same, I'm going to skip this one, uh, skip that one as well. What am I doing on time? I actually have a couple of... 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Let's do that one actually. All right, so, uh, so that's one way. And then, then there's this issue of optimism. So there's actually been a number of studies looking at optimism uh, as a predictor of how long people live. And this is a study in Dutch men and followed them for around 12 years or 14 years and then looked at the people who were optimistic versus less optimistic and found that people who were optimistic high on the scale actually lived longer uh, by a fairly large margin. We have looked at this questionnaire on resilience, uh, which is a separate topic, which I think is particularly relevant for chronic illnesses. And what we found is that this scale kind of has four components. So the first one is feeling like you're in control of your life and you're oriented towards goals. Another one is that you can adapt and tolerate negative emotions. And then the other ones have to do with spirituality and leadership. Uh, but the one that seemed to be associated most with positive outcomes in aging is being able to tolerate negative emotions. So basically to be able to adapt to things again. And that was what we found. And what we found is that even among older adults that were depressed, if you still had some resilience, uh, I won't begin to explain this figure, but if you still had some higher uh, level of resilience, you seem to be able to feel like you're a success in life. Uh, so this resilience, I think, is something that's really protective when it comes to, uh, when it comes to aging. And I think it deserves a lot more study. OK, so I'm going to close out with a couple of sl slides from some work that I've done on uh, day, there's something called the day reconstruction method, which is a, it's, a, it's actually a measure of what people do with their time. And you're asking people kind of what they're doing in the moment, and then asking them how they feel in those moments. Um, and from a, I won't bore you with the details, but um, there's some big differences between what people think make them happy and then what really seems to make them happy. So when you ask them uh, when people are happiest, usually people will say, I'm, it's when I'm with my kids. Uh, but when you actually look at these kind of data about what people are doing when they report being happy, uh, it's usually when they're with their kids is when they're the most stressed and least <laughs> yeah. happy. Um, and so we can use this to kind of understand what is it that people are doing across the lifespan when they feel the best or when they're the happiest. And this is uh, in aging, and so this is the top three activities, the ones that make people the most happy over time. And so you see exercise is that actually the, the the actual activities are fairly consistent across the lifespan. So exercise is actually something that's associated with high levels of happiness for whatever reason. So is socializing. What's the unique part about aging, I think, so it's actually pretty consistent across age, but people in their 60s and 70s report working as something that's actually something that people enjoy. When you look at the bottom levels of things, uh, when people think that people really don't like relative to, to others, Work in younger people is something that people really don't enjoy, but that sort of drops off. Um, so when you think about adaptation, I think being involved in work is something that's particularly useful for older people. But a, a real consistent phenomenon, I think, is that people uniformly do not enjoy themselves while they're watching TV. And this is something that's uh, uh, evident in a lot of respects. And there's actually been a number of studies linking TV with sedentary behavior, with so it's a bad outcomes. When we looked in these data, which is around 4,000 Americans, we found that older people spend a heck of a lot of time watching TV. Uh, so people uh, in their 60s and 70s, about two thirds, I'm sorry, about a third to 25% of time is spent, at least reporting, watching TV. And they obviously do more other types of leisure activities. 
but let's allow the TV. And that's actually basically saying is that even though older people are more satisfied with their lives, they spend a lot of time watching TV, which is something that they would rather not be doing, at least according to these data. Okay, just a couple more slides from this area. What other uh, areas, how much time you spend with other people? So when you're younger, you spend around 35% of your time by, uh, by yourself. When you're older, between 60 and 75, uh, it's about 60%. Uh, so it more than about doubles. And then the, when you think about this as it would pertain to positive emotions, people actually, across their lifespan, feel happier when they're around other people. Um, uh, just by and large. One difference is that when you're younger, you're happiest when you're around your spouse compared to anyone else. And then when you're older, you're actually happier when you're around anyone else compared to your spouse. So that's a, that's a little bit of a, a difference there. But you're happier than when you're by yourself. So just in terms of thinking about the modifiable factors in successful aging, just to review, it would include things like exercise, diet, mental activities, cognitive stimulation, uh, optimism, social integration, having a positive attitude towards aging, stress reduction obviously, and then preventing um, chronic illnesses. But I think each of these could be seen as a potential treatment for things like depression as well that we may not think of when we talk to, to doctors who are treating us for mental health problems. So just to summarize the whole big picture, there's many choices I think when you think about the de definition of successful aging and, and positive aging and how we even des describe the word, but I think there really is a research role for understanding the success and trajectories and adaptations and how people adapt to chronic mental health problems and helping them teach us how best to, to live with these illnesses. And then really when you think about the, the determinants of successful aging, they are both negatively impacted by mental health problems, but also potential treatment targets that we may not be necessarily thinking of all the time when it comes to, to help people. So with that, I've, you know, this is a kind of stuff that we're working on and we'd love to you know, keep you guys updated on it. And so this is a big thank you from the Stein Institute of Research on Aging. And so thanks for the opportunity to be happy to.